Welcome everyone to Talks at Google. My name is Jennifer Fernick, and I'm an engineer here at Google specializing in cryptography and security. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Dr. Aomawa Shields. We're going to spend some time discussing her new life on other planets. And then toward the end of our discussion, we will take some audience questions. So please submit your questions throughout our presentation to the Q&A feature. Dr. Shields is a professor at the University of California, Irvine, specializing in astronomy and astrobiology. She is also an author, a mother, a mentor, and a classically trained actor whose work has been shown at the Sundance Film Festival. She's held numerous honors, including as a TED Fellow, holds an NSF Career Award, and a NASA Habitable, Habitable Worlds and Exoplanets Research Grant. Professor Shields, I'm so excited that of all the planets around all the stars and all the galaxies in the entire universe, we're here together right now in this moment and on this video call. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. So there's, you know, a wild range of incredible things discussed in your book, but I want to start with the science. Tell us a bit about your life's work. What is the big question that you're trying to answer? And what is your particular approach to this research in seeking to answer that question? Well, one, one of my main questions that we are working towards answering is, are we alone in the universe? Um, and Know, that along the way, we have to ask many other questions, including which kinds of planets do we want to look for and look toward to answer that question. Um, and so my group, we tackle that question using something called computer climate modeling. So we are using models that were historically used to predict climate and weather patterns on the Earth on this planet. Um, but we get to change things about those models. We get to change things like the kind of star the planet is orbiting, um, the shape of the orbit, the tilt of the planet's axis, the kind of atmosphere that might exist on that planet. And all of these knobs we get to turn to identify which planets would be the most likely to host habitable conditions um, across the, the widest range of factors. That's Those sorts of planets are the ones we wanna prioritize to look for the next planet in the universe where life exists. So we can do this with observation, certainly that's important to find the planets um, first. And then my work picks up where those observations leave off because there's still a lot that we just don't know about those planets that we find. Wow. So help me get a sense of scale. How many uh, planets or galaxies are out there and how does this scale affect the likelihood that life well, one of the, the kind of statistics that I love to share in these sorts of conversations is, you know, there are 10 to the 22 stars in the observable universe. And that number is itself, as I write in my book, so hard to comprehend, like what's 10 to the 22. And so to understand that, if you're, if you're used to going to the beach or you know, you're, you've done that before, um, go to the beach on a sunny day, pick up a handful of, of sand and look at that, look at how many grains of sand are simply in your palm. Now think about this number 10 to the 22 is equivalent to the number of dry grains of sand on all the beaches in the world. Wow. So that, that, like that is getting in the ballpark when we're talking about the number of stars that are out there. And we know that around every, just about every star, there's a planet. And about 20 to 25% of those planets are in what we call the habitable zone, this sort of sweet Goldilocks spot um, around the star where a planet may be warm enough to have liquid water. And that's the main criterion that we use for looking to a planet that might have a climate that could host life. We know that all life on this planet needs liquid water from the mm -hmm. tiniest microbe to the largest elephant. And so though not the only way that life sur could survive, probably it is sort of the one common denominator amongst all the life that we have present on this planet. So that's really our guiding light. Um, and so that, you know, that 20% of all stars could have this sort of these planets in their, you know, in their orbits. Um, and almost every star has a planet. So those just through sheer numbers alone, we have, I, I like to think about that, uh, that line from the movie Contact. Um, it was, you know, long ago for those who are in their 20s, they're like, what is that movie at all? But <laughs> that, you know, 1997, I believe is when that movie came out. And it's a fantastic movie and an even better book. And in that movie, Jodie Foster's character, Eleanor Arroway says, if it's just us, it would be an awful waste of space. 
And that's what I believe. I mean, this number 10 to the 22, that gives us a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. to find life. The odds are good. Okay. So tell us more about exoplanet habitability. Like what are the properties, you've talked about water, what are the properties that you're looking for on these planets that means it might be habitable? And maybe tell us about some of your work with like extremophiles and what this tells us about habitability. Yes. So one of the first things that we want to find out is from this subset of planets that are in the habitable zone that from which we've found already. So we have close to 5,500 planets around other stars that have been discovered. So 5,500, we call them exoplanets for short. And of those, a few dozen maybe might be in that sort of habitable zone. And what we want to do is determine which of those planets would exhibit habitable conditions, meaning warm enough for liquid water to flow on the surface and yet not too warm that that liquid water could evaporate away. So you know, amenable conditions for liquid water. And that's what we can do with climate modeling. We can't yet, for the smallest Earth-sized planets, we don't know very much about them. We can hopefully determine, you know, that, yes, that they are the size and, and the ballpark of the Earth, which means they're likely to be rocky. We know that if a planet is about one to one and a half times the size of the earth. It's probably something that something could stand on. <laughs> and if something could stand on it, then oceans could flow on it, you know? And mm -hmm. so that tells us we want to prioritize those when we're talking about looking for life. But just because we found that kind of earth-sized planet doesn't mean that it has the conditions amenable for, for life, that it has, you know, li liquid water on it. So you know, that that first step is finding the planet. The second step is you know, using our models to, de to determine if that planet could have these conditions across the widest range of possible atmospheres and sizes of, and shapes of the orbit, the, all these things that we can't yet constrain with observations, mm -hmm. that's where our work can come in. We can fill in the gaps. That's and then if we once we have a bunch of planets that, that we know of, you know, this planet would, you know, be warm enough for liquid water, but not too warm across this wide range of factors, those are the planets that we would want to prioritize with you know, missions like James Webb and next generation missions to see if there might actually be signs of life in their atmospheres. And you know, we look for things called biosignatures. And this, these are biologically generated impacts to a planet's environment that we could observe from space. Mm -hmm. Things like you know, a combination of gases, this recipe, and that in itself is an entire discipline, looking for this perfect recipe of gases that life could emit into the atmosphere, that if we observe them, we would say only life could do that. Mm -hmm. And coming up with that recipe is really hard. Um, and it's not just about the atmosphere, it can also be what's on the surface. If we could detect something like the glint, like sunlight, um, reflecting off of liquid, that could tell us that water's there. However, there's a <laughs> caveat because just because it's a liquid doesn't mean it's water. Right. Um, you know, Saturn's <laughs> moon Titan is has a liquid on it, but that liquid is not liquid water. It's liquid ethane and methane. <laughs> so if we find life there, it would be life as we absolutely do not know it. Um, so I want to ask you about that because you're talking about life as we know it. What do you mean by that? And what do you mean by life as we do not know? What is the possibility mm -hmm. in that space? The, the wonderful thing about astrobiology is that there's so much that we don't know still. There are astrobiologists who, like me, are astronomers and are focusing on the planets and how do we find a planet with an environment conducive to life. There are also astrobiologists who are oceanographers and are thinking about ways that we could use our oceans as an analog environment to help us to determine whether life could exist on Jupiter's moon Europa, because there is a liquid there that, and it's liquid water. However, it's underneath an ice crust. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're going back to, to Europa and we're going to try to drill through that ice and see if there's anything swimming around in there. Um, so this, this field of astrobiology, which is very, very new compared to the field of astronomy. Um, astrobiology is, you know, 
60, 70 years old, right? Astronomy is, it goes back to um, the beginning of time. <laughs> um, and, and yet it's so interdisciplinary, that word mm -hmm. astrobiology. We have astronomers, biologists, and also geologists, oceanographers, glaciologists. So when we talk about life as we know it, we're talking about life as we're used to seeing it here on Earth. And even saying that, I mean, we have a diversity of metabolisms here on this planet. And I, I mentioned a couple of those extremes, microbial life, elephants, right? That's like the extremes <laughs> there. Within yeah. that, you know, within that, that range is, you know, this, this um, astronomical amount of, of different <laughs> types of life forms. Um, but that, that common denominator, liquid water mm -hmm. as a solvent, liquid water to be used to carry out the metabolic processes and chemical reactions that produce energy in these the bodies of these creatures on our planet to allow us to survive. That's what we, that's what we mean by life as we know it. Life as we do not know it would perhaps use something else other than liquid water. And that in terms of what that might be, there are astrobiologists whose job it is to focus on the, those questions. How else might life be able to um, continue to survive using something else in its DNA backbone other than um, what we use? Um, whether that's, you know, instead of carbon, um, perhaps silicon, you know, mm -hmm. or instead of liquid water, maybe liquid ethane. Could that happen? How would that happen? How could liquid ethane and methane be used in place of liquid water? So there are astrobiologists who are chemists and you know metabolic researchers who are developing and trying to understand alternative pathways that life could use to survive um, because we wouldn't want to miss out on the greatest discovery of our lifetime yeah. because we are so earth focused. Mm, because we have limited our view unnecessarily. Absolutely. Mm. We have to do both. Fascinating. So I, there's a question I can't help but ask you, and it's around climate change. So you study the properties of planets that make them able to support life. Given our current trajectory with climate change on Earth, how confident are you in the ongoing habitability of our planet to support human life? Mm. I, I write a little bit about this in, in the book. There's this question of that has come up and that I've been, been thinking about. There's so much that, that needs to happen on our planet to help improve its conditions. And climate change, I mean, many of us have seen in the past week alone, yes. um, the effects you know, from wildfires to hurricanes and earthquakes and it's all happening um the, the intensity is increasing the frequency is increasing um and it it's it's scary and these models that I, that we use to simulate the potential climates of exoplanets these are planets trillions of miles away were originally used to highlight and essentially prove the anthropogenic and that's a fancy word for human made impact of carbon dioxide induced climate change into the 2100s. Like these very models were used to show that, yes, it's us and it's only us that's doing that. You know, there's a natural cyclical process, um, cyclical uh, uh, change in CO2 that happens because of vegetation, there's natural wiggles and, and David Keeling revealed those, um, you know, back in the, I think it was the sixties. But what we see is not just a natural cyclical change. We see this slope. That cyclical thing is there's a slope going this way, <laughs> you know, and that and that is increasing the overall um, globally average surface temperature by you know by a couple of degrees uh, at least. And and we're trying to reduce that. And that and that may not sound like a lot. It's a lot. Um, and so often there's this question of why do we want to even think about other planets that are out there when we have so much to do with this planet. And um, if there's anything that my book has shown, it's that it, it's not about either or. It's both and. Um, that we need to, yes, address climate change. Um, I was uh, privileged to be able to teach my first ever energy and the environment course here at UCI. Um, and it was an astronomer teaching an energy conservation course. <laughs> 
I was learning along with my students and I got to learn a lot about, you know, fossil fuels and where they come from and what, you know, and why they are so prevalent and how long our planet can actually exist using those alone. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's very, um, you know, there's a reality here that we have to, we must develop new energy sources because our fossil fuel reserves are limited. Um, and plus we see what is happening to our planet when we are using those fossil fuels. You know, we see that, we see that in, in uh, quite starkly. So I, I think that understanding how our planet has been impacted by carbon dioxide, you know, we have too much of it has allowed me to apply that to these studies of other planets. Some planets that are very far away from their stars um, could use a lot of carbon dioxide, you know, in that case, because they are very cold. That is not our problem. Um, and so it, it, this work helps, helps me to both understand the exoplanet environments more clearly and also to, to kind of be very um, clear on, on our, you know, the needs of our, of our planet in terms of addressing climate change. And I'm hopeful. Um, I'm hopeful that what all of us are seeing now um, will, will help us move in the direction that we need to move to be able to make the changes that are required. That's really powerful. And how far away are the next closest potentially habitable planets? Gosh, these are still trillions of miles away. <laughs> and that's, the, that's our greatest hindrance to, or I'll say, you know, obstacle Mm -hmm. to um, answering this question quickly is yeah. the, the sheer distances that have to be traversed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one light year, and we measure distances, these astronomical distance in, in light years, even though a light year is actually, it's a distance, it's not a time, it's the distance light travels in one year, and that's about 10 trillion miles. And, um, and that, the closest planet that is uh, potentially habitable and that it orbits its star at a region where it could have, you know, it could have that, that climate is uh, Proxima Centauri B orbiting the closest star to us, but that's four light years away. So that's still trillions of miles away. Um, and our space propulsion capabilities, you know, would, they're not, we're not yet capable of, of achieving those, you know, light speeds or even significant fractions of a light speed, but people are working on that. Um, and the, the hope that we might be able to travel to these new worlds, you know, it, it's, it's going to take a while. However, we are seeing that the information that we're getting from our instrumentation is far exceeding our expectations. I remember mm -hmm. being at a conference where the James Webb Space Telescope was not really being lauded as something that we could used to find out much about Earth-sized planets. Um, and yet, here we are, we have confirmed the presence of an Earth-sized planet with James Webb. Um, and I, I don't believe that was anticipated. And so now we're also moving into trying to figure out what's in the atmosphere using James Webb, you know, to figure out what's in the atmosphere of that Earth-sized planet. So for now, it's really relying on this, this telescope instrumentation and advances in that instrumentation to help us understand what's in these environments. And hopefully one day we'll be able to traverse those large distances to hopefully visit what we find that's there. Wow. It's like viscerally exciting to hear you talking about eventually maybe being able to travel to places. Um, it, it makes a strong case as well for basic research because you're talking about how we didn't know in advance of building the telescope that we'd be able to use it for these purposes and that it unlocks all of these things that we may not have anticipated. Um, so I'd like to talk to you more about the kind of experimental techniques to use to get at this information. Um, and also it wouldn't be Google if I didn't ask you a computer question. <laughs> so in your work, um, you talk about computational modeling and detecting life from afar. What is it that we currently can and cannot do in computational astronomy? And like, what are the upper limits on what we can do with the combination of the computational modeling that you mentioned and with telescopes? And how do you see this changing in the next decade or two? I'm, I'm really curious, like, do you feel that there's fundamental limits on what we can know about life in the universe through these current approaches in observational astronomy? Mm, yeah. That's a that's a multi-layered question. Um, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. Thank you for it. So, 
with observations, mm -hmm. even with the most powerful telescopes, we are limited in what we can, what we can um, reveal about these planets' environments. So we might be able to, and we can, we can determine the planet's size depending on the, the telescope method. Um, there's a method called the transit technique where we're looking for a planet through, it's through an indirect means. We're looking and inferring the presence of a planet by looking at the dip in light that occurs in the star when the planet passes in front of it. So there's a little bit of a dip in light that happens and we can measure that dip and it's, if it's periodic, that tells us something is orbiting around that star mm -hmm. that's you know, passing in front of it and blocking it out for a little bit of time um, somewhat. And we can measure that dip and that the, the ratio of that, uh, the ratio of the areas allows us to determine the size of the planet. So the amount of that dip in light. Um, if we use a different technique called the Doppler technique or the radial velocity technique, that is actually measuring, again, it's indirect because we're not literally taking any information about the planet itself, like not taking a picture of the planet. We are inferring the presence of a planet by looking at how the, the, the gravitational changes in the star's orbit because the planet is orbiting around it. And in fact, they're both orbiting what's called a common center of mass. But that orbit the star does is much smaller because it's more massive. And so it's doing a little bit of a wobble and the planet's doing a big one. Um, and we can measure that amount of wobble and that tells us something about the mass of the planet. If we can get information about from both of these methods about the same planet, mass information and size information, that allows us to learn a new property of the planet that's very important. And that's take you back to your you know, geometry of like, you know, eighth grade geometry, or whatever, like the, the density, you know, we can do that, that mass over volume calculation. And we and that allows us to determine the density of the planet. And that helps us identify if these planets are likely to be rocky versus gaseous, a lot of water versus a lot of iron. Um, and there are astronomers who can use that information to determine what the compositional makeup of a planet or the planet's environment in which it's been um, born is like. Um, so those are the main things that observations can tell us. Sometimes we can learn information about the orbit or the tilt of the planet, but for the Earth's, as I said, those the atmospheric composition, that's we're still limited in our ability to use telescopes to determine the atmospheres of these Earth-sized exoplanets. We can pick out atmospheric constituents of larger Jupiter, maybe Neptune-sized planets that we find out there, um, but not the Earth's yet. And that's what we want to do: is to to tell you know what's on the at what's in the atmosphere and what's on the surface mm -hmm. of these Earth-sized planets. So with these computational models that we run, um, we're not limited in that way. <laughs> we can <Right. laughs> run the model and be like, okay, we don't know what the surface is. Let's give it a surface and let's see how that surface composition affects climate. Mm -hmm. Because putting ice on a planet's surface versus ocean will give a very different climate versus a granite surface versus vegetation versus calcite versus dune sand. And we can do all of those calculations and we can tell an observer, okay, this planet that you found um, would be way too hot if the planet's covered in ocean because it would make it, it would form a, you know, steam atmosphere, it's, it's too close to its star, that water would evaporate away and, you know, in less than a million years, that planet is probably headed for a, a runaway greenhouse state, like mm -hmm. we think Venus probably succumbed to. Or we can say, the planet you found, man, no matter what we throw at it, calcite, atmosphere full of CO2, atmosphere with full of oxygen, atmosphere that has this, this different recipe, atmosphere that has um, you know, no ozone or ozone, we can't make it uninhabitable. You know, it's <laughs> inhabitable for a bunch of different things. We, this is the planet that you need to follow up on and look for signs of life in its atmosphere. Um, our models, the thing about, and I, I, I appreciate this question of where is the field heading? Um, our models are not fast. <laughs> <laughs> 
there are like one dimensional versions that we use and that I often start my graduate students out using because they are fast and mm -hmm. you know, they oversimplify, but they give us some good solid zeroth order information about what a planet's climate would be like um, as a function of various parameters that we might want to explore. And then for the more sophisticated modeling, we need to go to three dimensional um, global climate models and they can take a couple of weeks to reach thermal equilibrium mm -hmm. and and do what you can imagine doing that a model running a model for one planet would take, right. you know, take us a couple of weeks and that and then we might want to run it a model again changing some other knob you know so that could be weeks upon weeks um, and some of the studies we do are not associated with any specific actual observed planet it's mm -hmm let's create a planet around this star and see how yeah. how its environment and climate would be effect, affected by these sorts of stellar characteristics. Um, those, those are some of my favorite types of studies. So there is a movement to, uh, you know, to use more of a statistical framework for these kinds mm -hmm. of, of climate modeling studies. And it's something that I have not been as, as involved in. Um, I, to some degree, I'm starting to be involved with some collaborators and I see the benefit um, of trying to, to apply statistics and maybe even some of the you know, AI methods to being able to do this, um, as long as we're not sacrificing robustness and scientific yes. rigor. And that I think is my, um, you know, my main um, concern there is that yes, these studies are not the quickest, but boy, do we, we pay a lot of close attention. We're looking at the climate modeling output and and there's no substitute for an actual human looking at this data and mm -hmm. determining hey this this little effect is is scientific versus this is an artifact an artifact in the model yeah. that i don't think is scientific you know let me like or it's not it doesn't look physical let me dive in there and see what's causing it you mm -hmm. know and and that that is something that takes time and that I, I wouldn't necessarily want to rush because it might mean missing, you know, the, the real and, and separating the physical from, right, the, the potential model limitations. Right. Um, I, you know, I didn't expect us to go in this direction, but I'm so excited by what you're saying, because for me personally, I mean, um, before I started doing cryptography, which is all about what kind of math we can efficiently do or not do in what direction, um, my PhD area was quantum computing, and we were looking at, in the physical substrates of computers, um, are we able to make certain classes of computational problems a lot more efficient? And that is like exactly, these are the types of applied problems where inventing these new kinds of computers and this new mathematics opens up an entire new world. So it's really exciting to think about these types of like computational cutting edge scientific questions that need perhaps next generation computers. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I was I I would love to talk with you more about cryptography. All right. So I would love to do that, but we're gonna switch gears because there's so many incredible things in your book. Yes. Um one thing I want to talk about is like other timelines. So in your book, you chronicle the way that engaging with the arts helped you become more of who you are and how you left your PhD and you returned and made a second attempt at your PhD 11 years later and it was very different. I'm curious, like, who do you think you'd have become if you had not made the brave step to leave your PhD the first time? And what would have happened if you just forced yourself to kind of fit the mold of what you thought a scientific career or a scientist looked like? Mm. I think about that sometimes uh, because I, I, I could have. It's like that that road not taken or the road less traveled. You know that, that like what would it what would my entire life have been like if I had taken another path? And there are movies that, as you like, I, I mentioned a lot of different movies in the book because movies have always inspired me. And I remember I think it was called Sliding Doors, the movie with Gwyneth Paltrow, where that happened, where you got to see like one single one single decision and how it changed everything. Mm -hmm. um, if I had stayed, I I probably would have continued on in a regular in galaxy. So I had I had switched from my undergraduate thesis was on irregular galaxies mm -hmm. and star formation within those types of galaxies. And irregulars are like these clumpy galaxies that don't have any discernible shape. And then in that first PhD program, I started to focus on 
spiral galaxies. So there, I was not, exoplanets, the first exoplanet had been found the year before I started in, in that PhD program. Mm -hmm. And so I, I mean, I didn't, it wasn't, it was in its infancy. People didn't even think that this was gonna be a thing, you know, exoplanet mm -hmm. science. So I certainly don't think I would have gotten it and gotten into that field. Um, and gosh, there was so much that I would have missed out on mm -hmm. uh, in terms of learning about myself. You know, I, I had gone into that PhD program almost unconsciously uh, because I thought that's what you do. If you're going to continue in science, you go do the PhD. Yeah. But I don't think I had I'd done it for the for the, the the reasons that I did it the second time, which were that mm -hmm. I loved this thing and wanted to learn as much as I could about it. You know, that that wasn't the motivation for me going into the first PhD program. And it was the second time around. It was, I want, I want in, I want <laughs> in this field. Um, so, I, you know, and I, I know I, I wouldn't have met my husband because he was, mm -hmm. I met him in acting grad school. That's <laughs> so it's wild. Like That's so cool. Past <laughs> past. I wouldn't have had the daughter that I have now. So even though the, that was a difficult time for me and, and the catalyst for leaving was, was an unfortunate experience of, you know, being discouraged, um, uh, both externally and also internally. Um, I think that it's like things worked out the way they were supposed to. Seriously. Yeah, that brings me a lot of, of hope for the future and knowing that there's all these different paths we could take and this unique path that we carve, maybe it makes us better in ways we didn't expect. Now, in your book, um, you talk about some of the obstacles faced by underrepresented people in science, such as sexual harassment and systemic racism. Yeah. Um, do you feel that in some way the power structures in academia, for example, within PhD programs between a student and their supervisor, are things that we need to change to help make sure that the people that really want to be here, you talk with light in your eyes about, about how much you want to be there to help those people stay and pursue science as they were meant to do? It's very critical to understand the role that we as advisors of PhD students and of all students, undergrad as well, um, can play in, uh, in those students' lives. Mm -hmm. And it took me becoming a professor to realize like, wow, this is, um, I'm humbled and kind of awed by this amount of power because mm -hmm. I, you know, I, and I, I recognize having been on the other side of it and had someone say, Hey, you might want to consider other career options, you yeah. know, like, and, and to feel that because I thought that what they said was, was gospel essentially was the truth. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, I got to listen. This is a professor, you know, he <laughs> yeah. knows, he, um, must know. he must know he's yeah. you know, an authority. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think what I'm understanding now these days is it's, yes, I have a tremendous amount of power as an advisor in terms of, I could say a lot of things and those things have an incredible amount of the potential to have an incredible amount of influence on a, a more junior person. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I am not all powerful, meaning mm -hmm. I am not powerful enough to dictate someone's future. And I am not powerful enough to tell someone to, to, to foresee the future, to tell someone that they should not be this, the bit, mm -hmm. whether it's an astronomer, whether it's a pianist, whether it's a, you know, a skydiver, whether it's a construction worker, architect, like those, I, I'm not that powerful. What I can say is how much do you love this class? How much do you love this topic? How hard are you willing to work to yeah. get good at it or to get good enough to, pass my class. Um, but I'm not going to say you, you know, you need to, you probably should pick something else, you know, or, you know, are you sure you really want to be in this field? Like those, those questions are not ever going to come out of my mouth as an advisor, um, because I know how powerful they are when they do. Um, and I, and I'm very sensitive to that. And there's another piece too, which mm -hmm. is, when we talk about making making departments more inclusive, and this is thankfully much more of there's a there's an ongoing dialogue now in the way in a in a way the way that there wasn't um, maybe five years ago. Mm -hmm. 
it's not, as you mentioned, it's not simply about getting more black and brown students into astronomy departments or any departments in which they are underrepresented. Yeah. Um, it's about also keeping them there. Yeah. So it's not simply about recruitment, it's about retention. And an important key for me in, in um, understanding how to make retention more impactful um, is recognizing that when a, a student from a historically marginalized community walks into a classroom, they are carrying an enormous amount of baggage on their shoulders. Beyond the backpacks full of textbooks and the exams and the, and the study guides and the homework and all the things that people from historically um, in the majority, communities that are historically in the majority are bringing in the classroom. On top of that, they're also bringing in their own legacies of racism and oppression, their family history, all that they've had to um, surmount to be able to even walk into the classroom. Yes. Um, and being sensitive to that as a professor is something that that's, I think, new, a new idea that I hope uh, spreads within our department and within the departments of, of institutions all over the world, um, understanding that it's not simply what someone on the outside might be dealing with in terms of a quiz or a grade or like they need to study more at home. Or it's also like, what's, what's really going on that they're not talking about? Mm -hmm. And it's a tricky line because of course, you know, I don't wanna um, uh, to cross into the boundary of, of, of asking questions that are personal that a student may not wanna talk about. However, there are ways to do it in a way that that allows a student to know that that we're aware of it and we can ask you know i can ask like how are you <laughs> how are you really doing yeah. um is there anything going on that you'd like to talk about like these are questions that i don't think i was ever asked and this idea of the personal um when this with the sciences it was often viewed it as no one ever asked me like how do you feel about how you of what about what you're studying? You know, it was yeah. about like it seemed to be about what I could produce, what I could retain, what I could upload into my brain, and then yeah. download onto a, an exam. And you know, yeah. and, and it was always about the result. Um, and what we try to do with our my program, Rising Star Girls, is let these middle school girls of color know that who they are is essential to their study of astronomy. Yeah. We want them to bring in their family backgrounds and histories yeah. and the conversations they've had at the breakfast table and, and to know that, that that personal connection that they're developing between themselves and the universe, that's what's gonna allow them to feel anchored as they have to do all the heavy math as they continue on. You know, yeah. and, and I, I think that is something that I'd like to encourage students who are not middle school <laughs> girls of color, <laughs> student, you know, and us as professors that like the, per the personal informs the professional. Yeah. The personal allows me to be able to identify how I'm feeling about what I'm studying and to bring that into my daily work life. And that, you know, and that crosses into rest practices, you know, that that idea that like that to do list that I might have created three days ago may not be as applicable if I've had three hours of sleep last night. Right. Um, and I can use how I feel to inform my task list that day, you know, that I don't have to be a machine, that 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 how I feel personally ha absolutely impacts my ability to do good science on a given day. Um, and that 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 interweaving is essential to me being able to succeed, um, mm -hmm. both when I was a student and now as a professional. That felt really groundbreaking throughout your book as you spoke about that um, in having middle school girls connecting with science and with space in new ways. And when we think about this, this future science that, that's going to unfold before us, the idea that people can bring them their whole selves and get past that heavy math and not just have to take a leap of faith that one day it'll be interesting, but to have a personal connection to the philosophical question being asked between that and the idea that we can have people of all backgrounds feeling welcome and included and comfortable pursuing science. I think when we bring those two things together, it's so powerful to imagine the types of science we might otherwise have missed out. It really is. I agree. You know, I, the other day someone was asking me about what, what I think we're capable of in the next 
decade or two decades along the lines of, you know, are we going to be able to answer this question? Are we alone in the universe within our lifetime? Yeah. And, you know, not having a crystal ball, I can't say that definitively. And as a scientist, mm -hmm. I, you know, I have to say, like, I, I can't, can't say um, for sure. However, we were able to put a human on the moon within, by the end of that decade, because we worked hard. And here's the thing, not all of us were working on it. Not all of us were invited to be a part of that enterprise. Only a small fraction of people were allowed to be part, to be at the table and, and working on those, on those missions. What would it be like if everyone was, was allowed to be at the table? Yeah. I think there's nothing we couldn't answer. No question we could not answer. Um, and I think that, you know, this idea of inclusion and, um, and I dare say affirmative action, which is all about making sure that everyone has a place at the table. And doing away with affirmative action presumes that everyone already does, and we don't need anything like that anymore. And that, unfortunately, is not yet the case. So, yeah. you know, if everyone were at the table, um, we would it would allow us to be able to. If someone, you know, if a president or another world leader said, "We're going to answer this question: Are we alone in the universe?" by the end of the of 2050, mm -hmm. you know, I. I'm very, I'd be very excited to see how, you know, how much energy we could put into that task. And I think if everyone was allowed to be part of that discovery, um, we, we'd have a chance at, at reaching that goal. Yeah, we need everyone. Um, I want to invite one of the audience questions that come through. So um, we have Ronnie asking, uh, hi, Dr. Shields. It's so great to see you. Uh, sorry, this is from Jake. I apologize. Uh, you mentioned the discoveries that the James Webb Space Telescope has opened up. Are there other future observatories or satellites in the works that you're currently excited about? Jake, oh my gosh, it's so wonderful to see you. Jake and I went to grad school at the same time. Wow. <laughs> I think I'm looking at his picture and um, yeah, it's so, it's fantastic. Um, yeah, what a great question. Um, so, and as I said, JMWST, at least my understanding was that, you know, we were not even, those of us in exoplanets and astrobiology, we're not necessarily looking at that mission as we're gonna learn about life in the universe with James Webb. And yet we're, you know, we, we may, um, it's doing a lot more than we thought. The missions that were talked about at the time um, and that are continuing to be talked about are these sort of large aperture space telescopes. Um, and one of them is uh, LUVOIR, the large UV optical IR surveyor. I think that's what it's short for. Um, and HABEX, the Habitable Exoplanet Observatory. And these are larger, um, I think they're on the, and the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey has recommended something on the order of like maybe between a Louvoir and a Habex um, and the or, on the order of like a six meter mirror um, that we would need that large of a dish in space to be able to get the, to get the, have the light gathering power we would need to be able to see what's in the atmosphere of an exoplanet um, and to be able to do things like, you know, block out the light from the much, much brighter star. We're talking about a hundred million times brighter, 10 to the eighth in terms of contrast. Those stars are so bright, we need to be able to block out their light to be able to have a hope of taking a picture of an exoplanet. Um, so those missions, though they're still, a, I believe in the concept phase, those are, if, if greenlit to fly, those would give us so much more information um, uh, that, that we would need to be able to answer these questions and, and to, pick out that recipe of potential biosignatures. That's really exciting. Um, I, I could speak to you about these things all day, but I know that we've only got so much time together. So I guess I have just one more question for you. Um, one of the big themes in your book is about becoming who you really are instead of who you felt that you needed to be in order to be successful as a scientist. Um, what advice do you have for those of us who um, feel that we've been who we feel we have to be as scientists and engineers for so long that sometimes we feel like we don't really know who we actually really are. What steps can we take? And maybe, you know, some of these people could be middle school girls. Some of these people might be your interviewer in her 30s who's been working as an engineer <laughs> for a long time. What steps can we take to start discovering and becoming our whole selves perhaps for the very first time? 
Oh, I love that question. Um, what I realize in the writing of this book is it doesn't have to take radical changes overnight. You know, and you can tell from the book, it's not like I woke up one morning and was like, I'm going to grad school. And the next week yeah. I was there. It was a long process. Even, even the process of becoming willing to return to graduate school after an 11 year absence. I say, I call it a solar cycle. It was a solar cycle. Of 11 I years. love that. Um, you know, like that, it, it was small incremental steps. So it can start with an you know, it can start with like picking up something in the corner, like that guitar that has been gathering dust in the corner for five years. And you know, you've been wanting to play and haven't built in any time to picking it up for five minutes and playing not to sound good, but because it makes your soul happy. Um, or, you know, buying a magazine at the grocery store that it focuses on some topic that you really love and haven't looked into in a while and reading that in the morning with your coffee. These are ways that we can let the universe know that we're open and we're accepting of that part of ourselves. That we're not denying it. We're not ignoring it. Because let me tell you, dreams, they don't go away. They, if you're, if, if, if I ignore them, as I write about it, eventually they, they catch up and they knock on the door and they say, Hey, what about me? And the, and the, the effect might be physical, you know, this sort of gnawing feeling in the gut that like, I'm not, I'm not doing what I was meant to do, or it can be just my soul feeling sad a lot, you know? Um, so those little steps of, of letting something in and saying, I, I am accepting this about me. This is me. This is who I am. I don't know how to bring this into my life, but I'm willing and open. Those little steps and tasks that we can take um, and do can let the universe know. And what I've found as I, as I, my story shows is that miracles happen when I become open. Yes. Like I didn't have to do a whole lot and things just kind of fell into my lap, you know, from like, but, but what I did have to do was to acknowledge that this was part of me. Um, so that's, that's my biggest encouragement there is like, if you, if there's something that you feel is not being represented, you know, how can you bring it into your life if not on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, in some small manageable way, you know, and the universe will pick up on that and show you other ways um, that it'll be like more is going to be revealed in that regard. Yeah, that's very inspiring. Thank you so much. And hearing your story and how all of these things unfolded within the universe for you was so incredible. So thank you so much for this intimate and incredible conversation. To everyone tuning in, if you've not read it book yet, I cannot recommend it highly enough. The book is Life on Other Planets, A Memoir of Finding My Place in the Universe. Buy it, let it break you open, let it remind you that even when you feel completely alone in this world, you may not actually be alone in the universe. Thank you so much, Dr. Shields. Thank you everyone who joined us for your curiosity and your questions. And we'll see you next time on the next Toxic Google event. Goodbye.